Well, with me today is Kristen Bowen. She's founder and CEO of Living the Good Life Naturally. Kristen, welcome to the Rest Recovery Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, uh, excited to to have you on um, as I dug in and learned about your world of, well, I'll call it nutrition, but not necessarily in the, in the context you would think of like consuming food per se, but uh, in what you do with your company and, and all the, the things that are really health supportive. Um, but you have your own little backstory on kind of how you, you kind of found your way through into this lifestyle. Maybe, uh, you know, touch a little bit on that and how you kind of came to establish living the good life naturally. Okay. It living the good life naturally truly created itself in that I had so many people coming to ask me, what did you do to put your health back together? Because my health crashed just over 20 years ago. Um, I just had a baby, my fourth baby, and I was having some bladder leakage issues. And so I went back into the OBGYN and he said, oh, your bladder's fallen. We need to put it back up. And in the course of that happening, the short story is I had an autoimmune, went into that surgery with a known autoimmune. I have celiac disease Okay. and they put titanium in me. Now, at the time that that surgery was done, titanium was considered inert. It doesn't cause problems with anyone. Now we know that especially those with autoimmune disorders, that there can be a reaction to the titanium. Oh, wow. So number one, I did have a reaction that's called Melissa syndrome for anyone out there that, that has, is struggling after a surgery and you can't put the pieces together. Please look up Melissa syndrome. It's a real thing. It's documented. And I experienced that. One of the other things that led to my heart stopping on the table during the surgery and ending up on feeding tubes and catheters and colostomy bags and in a wheelchair having seizures was we lived in an area that was experiencing incredible explosive growth and the medical community couldn't keep up with it. And at the time is how they did a bladder tie up is they would take cadaver graft and make a sling. And then they'd put that bladder in the hammock to hold it up. And so they did that on me and that cadaver graft was bought off market. So years later, when we went again to take that out, because my quality of life was non-functional, there was no, everything's tagged when, when they use things like that. And there was no tag on mine, meaning it had been bought off market and it had mold on it. And so the combination off market body part, like it doesn't sound. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it doesn't, (laughs) does it, but it is what it is. It's and is what happened was the combination of an autoimmune disease that I already had mold on the cadaver graft Mm -hmm. and the reaction to the titanium, my system just shut down, just absolutely shut down. And I was raised in a very Western medical home. You do what the doctor says. And people that think like I do now were kind of out there and a little kooky. Uh, My family has all come around though. I want you to say they have all (laughs) slowly their own journey, but they've all come around um, now. And so it, it really took that crash, that absolute loss of, we lost our home. We, I mean, we just, we tanked, we lost everything and it took that much of a crash to really get me to open up my eyes and take more responsibility and accountability for the choices that I was making because I had grown up with this philosophy and nobody ever really said it, but it's what I did in that I would go to the doctor and I was tired. I, it was experiencing depression and I just didn't feel good. And I would lay all that responsibility on him and my expectation. I never said it to him or her. My expectation was give me a pill and make me feel better. Mm -hmm. And that's really short-sighted and and taking back my accountability and taking responsibility for the choices. You can't drink diet Coke at the level I was drinking it and expect to have optimal energy. It just, 
doesn't happen. And so it was through that process that I really learned how to divide out what things that I was accountable for and take more accountability for those things. That, um, wow, that's a pretty amazing story. I mean, I think, I think that last part is kind of the crux of it, right? Is taking that personal responsibility of your own path and your own health. Uh, and as much as we need to rely on doctors and, you know, modern medicine has its place, um, but it's not designed for maintenance or lifestyle. It's designed for, unfortunately, the things you went through. And I'm glad that they are there, but I was using the system inappropriately. I right. was expecting something from the system that they weren't trained to do. Right. And, and so it was weeding those out and putting the boxes in the right places that I realized there is so much that I can do to take care of myself so that I don't end up in that situation again. And it was imperative for me because, you know, at the time, think of where I was at. I had these young children and sure. I, I think pretty much I've never met a mom yet that doesn't have moments of absolute overwhelm, just overwhelm. Yeah. And so if you're in that place of overwhelm and somebody says to you here, take more responsibility well, we're just going to push that away because as a society, we've bought into overwhelm as an emotion and mm. overwhelm is not an emotion. It's the consequence of lack of action. And we need to separate that out because okay. if somebody's overwhelmed, how are they going to take more accountability and more responsibility for their health? So we've got to deal with that overwhelm and move it out so that they can take action. Because in fact, you and I were just talking about this before the podcast started in that our end goal is today, someone listening right now in this moment that they take action. Right. And that's what excites me. In fact, sometimes my, my adult kids will turn to me and be like, mom, that's your crack cocaine. When somebody takes action, it's so exciting to me because I know that as those small actions are taken and as you build them in their proper order, starting with that foundation, people get feeling better. Yeah. And when that happens, they wake up, not just, Oh, five more minutes of sleep, because we know that's a lie. Five more minutes isn't going to do anything. They wake up feeling good and they share their gifts and it's crazy out there in the world. It's yeah. 2021 when you and I are recording this and there's so much chaos and we need more women. That's who I focus on. We need more women showing up, feeling good, sharing their gifts and truly making a difference in our world. Yeah. And you know, I will, obviously I'm not a woman, but I'm married <laughs> to one uh, and a mother and who went through her own story, not mm. quite the same as yours, but all, we had three, three girls and each one was a pretty traumatic um, birth experience. Oh. And so dealing with those things and having to go through that process, I can relate at least on this side of it. Right. And seeing that evolution or de-evolution of a process. Harder so, to come back after each birth. Yeah. You know, just so, kind of bury it down a little bit further. So as it relates to what we were just talking about that, that practical foundational step, right? That's it. And having to unpack the overwhelm piece too. How do you get through that? But what, maybe let's start there with overwhelm. How redefine overwhelm for us. If it's not an emotion, what, what is it? It's a direct consequence of not taking action. So both so on action again. We've, it comes down to take an action and, and sometimes, and again, I'm working with women. And so I'd love to know your experience with this, how it relates to you. Sometimes as women, we don't take action because we're waiting for that perfect piece of action. And it's not there. It, it, it is not there. 
imperfect action. In fact, this morning I was on a group call with the most amazing women. And one of our things that the habits that we have is we share our imperfect action steps and every single one of them who shared their imperfect action steps steps, I said to them, are you closer to help because of the imperfect action? And they all were like, absolutely. Yes. But we can buy into that lie of the perfect action of researching, researching. We have a bunch of really educated sick people because we're researching, researching, and we have a flood of information at our fingertips. And one person says this, and another person says this, and this person says that doesn't work. And, and it's so confusing. And we hit overwhelm because we didn't. Yeah. And so taking action becomes a critical component piece of creating help. Yeah. And I think, I think that's such a, root to any success, right. Is just taking that next best step. And that's, that's whatever, you know, right then. And if it's four steps later, you realize, all right, you shouldn't have taken it. You still took action towards something. It probably helped somewhere. And we often forget that eliminating the not is also just as much or as important as eliminating the what to do. I love that you said that because the difference between a healthy person or a person who's creating health and achieving it and a sick person is how they handle when it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. A sick person gets overwhelmed, gives up, turns away, and just is done for a while, usually three to six months. And then they come back and they restart. And they're in a lower place than they were before. It's more exhausting. It's more overwhelming, but a healthy person will actually celebrate. Oh, I know exactly it. It does not matter how much anyone markets to me on social media. I know that that does not work for me and I never have to mess with it again. And that is incredible to know that is knowledge. And sometimes we push that knowledge away because it's not what we wanted to hear, Yeah. but finding out what doesn't work is as vitally important as finding out what does work. Well, and I think if we, we make it into an absolute, like it's not, it's not an absolute as in right or wrong, true, false. Like the, these are, um, you know, degrees discussions on a lot of it on good, better, best based on your personal circumstance. Like what may work for me as a mid forties male may not work for you, but there may also be correlations. Um, They may work for me and you Um, and finding that, that, that tension and being able to trial and experiment and be okay with it kind of not working for a minute or not the degree you think it should. Right. Right not controlling that outcome. And I call that building a trust bank. You have to build that trust bank that you will find that thing. Because if you don't have that trust bank built, when it doesn't work, how you thought it was going to, the overwhelm kicks in. Yeah. And then you're like, all right, I tried that, you know, the one time and then you're done. Right. Right. So at that foundation, uh, there's some key minerals and, and ingredients. I think it's kind of the basis of some of the things that you offer and present. So magnesium, um, maybe let's dig into that a little bit on how that plays a key ingredient to okay. our, our overall wellness. Okay. So my mantra is sunshine, magnesium, sunset. And then that little mantra are so packed so many things. So first understand where I was coming from. I was chasing symptoms naturally. I had a cupboard full of supplements that I'd given up on. I couldn't even really remember what they were supposed to do for me. And so it's all about building a strong foundation, giving your cells what they need, and then determining what symptoms do I have left? And so in that sunshine, magnesium, sunset, we're outside walking. We're walking. 90% of women experience insulin resistance. 
Hmm. And you get that because you don't have enough vitamin D, you don't have enough magnesium, and you don't walk enough. And the simple process of walking in the early morning sunshine will bring down inflammation layers. And we know when you bring down inflammation layers, it becomes easier to create health. Inflammation drives all disease. And then when you soak in your magnesium, you're activating that beautiful vitamin D that you got outside in the sunshine. If you have low vitamin D, you don't have enough magnesium Hmm. and synthetic oral magnesium does not get you to cell saturation. I'm all about achieving cell saturation and changing the environment in your body and going from calcium dominant to magnesium rich. Because when you do that, along with that morning walk in the sunshine, you are increasing your magnesium levels, you're decreasing your inflammation, and you're activating your stored vitamin D to convert to active vitamin D. And in 2021, most of us have a deeper understanding of how important our immune system is. And your immune system cannot activate without adequate amounts of active vitamin D. And so many times we've got all these people just supplementing with all this synthetic vitamin D. That doesn't move your active vitamin D. We need that magnesium moving that vitamin D so that we've got optimal health happening. So real quick, can you unpack what you mean by active vitamin D? Yeah, we have stored. There are actually two vitamin D tests, calcidiol. One is stored, one is active. It's the active vitamin D that our body can convert. So we can have loads of stored vitamin D, but if we don't have enough magnesium to move it into active vitamin D that the body recognizes and can utilize doesn't matter how much stored vitamin D we have. So vitamin D and magnesium go hand in hand. So, okay. So they're a pairing, right? They're just synergistic. It's like my husband and I, I'm good on my own, but I'm so much better with that man. There you go. (laughs) It's just, it's that same thing. They just work together. They work together. Beautiful. Meant to be. Awesome. So what was it that kind of like got you down this path of realizing this is like a missing link in, in your walk per se, or, or as you kind of evolve, like hearing from other people. So it was putting the pieces of my own body back together. And after the three and a half years, I was so sick and my husband and my mom now recognize at this point, I am completely insulated. I am so sick. I don't realize how sick I am Mm. and I don't realize what a devastating toll it's been on my young family. And so um, my husband just took me from doctor to doctor, Stanford, Mayo, just anybody that could help, you know, put it back together. And um, we found, he found a physician's assistant that was willing to think out of the box. And he said, you know, I just read an article because my husband carried me in and said, this is my wife. (laughs) This is not how she was years ago. I want her back basically. And that physician's assistant was willing to think outside of the box. And he said, I don't know what's happening, but I do know there's some places that I can go to research. If you're willing to work with me and share insights and feedback. When I ask maybe some off the wall questions, he got back with my husband in a week and said, I think I figured it out. He had read an article about Melissa syndrome Hmm. and in conversation, him and I had talked about the autoimmune, the, the celiac disease. And he said, people with autoimmune have a higher um, prevalence for this Melissa syndrome. I think it's the titanium. And so at that point, my mom and husband had to decide, well, he turned to my husband, but my husband wasn't willing to make that kind of decision without my mom. He said, because that almost lost me three and a half years before on -hmm. the table. And so he was like, do we try it? But at the risk of losing her with these young children, but her quality of life, she's not raising them. And so 
the two of them decided that it, because of the quality of where my life was at, that it was the appropriate decision to go back on the table. Now they took the titanium out and it immediately made a difference wow. coming, coming out of that surgery. You know, when you're in that, that phase of the anesthesia, I could think I, it was like, Oh, immediately. I, I could, immediately. Wow. It wasn't, I wasn't back to where I was, but sure my brain had been so gone. I, I couldn't put pieces together. I couldn't tell you what my name was sometimes, you know, it just, it was just, my body was just over, overcompensating and overreacting to this titanium. Wow. And so my brain immediately felt better. But at that point I was down to 70 pounds and I'm five, seven that's not a healthy weight. And so, yes, my body in some ways was functioning so much better, but in other ways I was an absolute train wreck. I had so many, um, like I couldn't be in public people's perfumes would just set me off mm -hmm. and make me so sick. And, and so it was through me putting those pieces together and people started seeing the difference like, oh my gosh, Kristen, I've got a sister. Could you talk to my sister? Well, of course I'm going to talk to your sister because that helps me to put a little bit of goodness on the crazy that we experience. So, oh, could you talk to my aunt? Well, of course I'd love to talk to your aunt. And then it just started building. And my husband came to me one day and he said, honey, I love you. And I'm so glad that you, I'm seeing the fulfillment that you're finding in connecting with these people, but I need you to remember something. When you say yes to them, you're saying no to us. And we haven't had you for years. Mm. And that wow. was this moment for me that I wasn't thinking about that. I was just trying to feel, I felt such guilt and such shame for the financial wreck I'd put my family in and the mm -hmm. toll I'd put on my family. And I just wanted to feel good again. And at that point, I was still seeking outside things to make me feel good. I, I didn't understand what I do now. And that's when, and he said to me, I see people taking a little bit of advantage of you. You're spending hours with them. You're, you're researching for hours with them. And I think you need to charge them. If, mm -hmm. if you're going to take the time and I, I was like, oh, I can't charge them. You know where we've been. I can't. And he yeah. said, well, the amount that you charge is, is truly putting a value on the time that you spend with your family. And I realized, oh, it is. And when I started charging, I realized people were more respectful because I was setting a boundary. I, you know, we have this much time and yeah. at this time it, I'm done so that I can be with my family. And so that's literally how living the good life naturally was born. Well, and I think you hit on a key ingredient on healthy living and the good life is boundaries that <clears throat> we oftentimes, and you even just expressed it basically is like, we're, you were doing a good thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't wrong again, right or wrong. It was, it wasn't the best thing at that time. Right. That's such a huge lesson. I think for people to hear is that we all need reminding of that is, and I even have this conversation with my kids. Well, what's wrong with this? Well, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's not at the appropriate time to do a good thing right? because so, there might be something better to do right, right at this time. My father-in-law had a, had a saying that he said all the time and he said, good, better, best, which is it? Yeah. And I want the best and I was doing the good, but I, I want the best ultimately with my family. That's where my heart lies. And so in learning those boundaries I was able to, to slow down the rate that I was burning through magnesium, because when we have broken boundaries, when we have broken patterns, we actually burn through our minerals 
faster Mm. because it raises our cortisol level. And when our cortisol levels go up, health is not created in the body and magnesium is pushed out through the urine, creating a calcium dominant body. And so soaking in magnesium, one of the things that I do, because I'm so passionate about getting magnesium in without using oral synthetic isolated magnesium. And so I soak in it. And one of the things that I do while I'm soaking in that master mineral, it's a time for me to lovingly evaluate myself. How are my boundaries? How are my patterns? Am I seeking perfectionism and giving up and letting it frustrate me because I'm not perfect because I, I didn't check every single thing off my box that day to create health is my belief that I have to do all of those things or can I be healthy? And so that soaking time becomes a real time of self-reflection for me. That's a clever way to kind of, I'll call it habit stack. Um, I love stacking of habits. Oh my goodness. You and I (laughs) love stacking of habits. Yes. The the book that got me really hooked on, on that idea. And there's a couple, but is atomic habits by Mm -hmm. James clear. And I think he did the best job for me, uh, connecting the system piece of habits that we all want to accomplish things, but that emotional tie so that you're not into that perfectionism, but you're into accomplishing and getting that momentum. Right. Love that book. <laughs> Love that book. Yeah. If you haven't read that book, go read it. It's yeah. so good. It, it, it's definitely one of the best, best ones out there. So I, I want to touch on the burn rate, if you don't mind. Can you expand on that a little bit? Like, because oh. the personal anecdote, like I, I know my cortisol is pretty high. I, I use, um, uh, there's some at-home testing you can do that you can, uh, called vessel health and, uh, uh, oh, I cortisol, test mine. <laughs> cortisol through the roof. Right. So, and you mentioned calcium dominance. Mm-hmm. So maybe kind of unpack that a little bit. Absolutely. So when we don't have enough magnesium and there's several reasons we don't have enough magnesium, our food isn't the food that our grandparents ate. Mm-hmm. So it used to be, you could eat a red pepper and it would be loaded with magnesium for your body to utilize. Now, if you go to the grocery store to the organic section, that red pepper doesn't even have trace amounts of magnesium anymore. So first of all, there's, there are things outside of our control that have happened that have helped us walk across that boundary of calcium dominance because magnesium and calcium work together. We need both, but it's when we become calcium dominant that we start having issues. Veins become brittle. Well, Mm. that doesn't walk us toward health. And my son used to work. um, My husband grew up with no construction skills and he always said it was the biggest cost in our marriage. He didn't have those skills. And so he was determined that all of his, his kids would have those skill sets as they were raising their families. And so our oldest son um, worked with a cement guy. And think about it. You throw calcium into cement, what does it do? Hardens it. You create a calcium dominant environment in your body. And what does it do? That hardens everything. You, You lose the flow of minerals. You lose the flexibility of organs. You lose the ability for insulin to penetrate the cell because the cell gets a calcium shell. And so making sure that we are creating a magnesium rich environment is incredibly important and foundational, no matter what is happening in your body. It doesn't matter if it's hormone imbalance or low energy, or not sleeping, or autoimmune, or a thyroid, or adrenals, or any disease, any disease that anyone could name, we have to make sure that they have created a magnesium rich environment. That's a foundation that all of those diseases sit on top of when there's calcium dominance. And so making sure that we're getting enough magnesium and then 
your body's ability to hold on to magnesium is very different from mine, which is very different from my husband's. My husband is so chill. Everything's going to work out. Just everything's going to work out. We were having a conversation about some of my grandbabies. Oh, and I was like, what about this? And he was like, Kristen, just take a breath. It's they're going to figure it out. It's, it's going to work out. We can love a little here and guide a little bit there, but it's okay where my cortisol spiked. And when that cortisol spiked, I lost magnesium. And so understanding that determines how often you need to soak because my husband need to soak as often as I do, because he just, he was just born. His mom said he was the chillest baby. He was just born with that chill attitude. And I, my heart gets involved and, Oh, what about this? And, Oh, and when that happens, I am losing my master mineral and literally hmm. think about it. That's how powerful we are. Wow. We control our minerals. We yeah. control our minerals. Now I've learned a lot of things to help me keep my cortisol down. I don't know if I'm ever going to be as chill as that man is. I, in fact, I don't even know if I want to be that chill because sometimes I use it to get things done, but we have a very different burn rate, him and I. Now my eating, because the foods you eat determine your magnesium burn rate. If you eat sugar, you're losing your magnesium because of your food choices. If you eat processed carbs, you're losing your magnesium because of your food choices. When you drink alcohol, you're losing your magnesium because of your food choices. Medications, we need to look at medications. If someone is on a couple of medications and please know I'm throwing no shame on medications at all, none whatsoever, just a statement of fact, when you take that medication, most of them, I think it was, um, oh, she's my favorite pharmacist. I can't remember her name. She's written a book. Ah, I'm drawing a blank. Um, it's like 92% of all medications decrease your magnesium levels. Wow. And so all of these little things start to build this picture in our body of how much we hold on to magnesium and how much we push magnesium out. Now, I don't do sugar except one day a year. I have a bearded son. We call him the bearded one. And he cooks me um, float English floating custards for my birthday. Okay. And there is no way when he hands me those with all the love that he has, that I'm going to say, oh. I don't eat sugar. <laughs> I eat those and him and I talk and we reminisce and we love on each other. And it's something I look forward to every year. That's awesome. And I know when I eat those that I'm going to offset my soaking and increase my soaking because there's sugar in those floating English things that he makes me that are so delicious. <laughs> well, you know, you know, at sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. And uh, I'll call it, it once a year for him. I'll that's call right. it. <laughs> that's right. But it's important to know too, is like, you know, the puts and takes and then how to, how to offset that too. Right. Uh, right. And yeah. how to really that balance that, that teeter right. totter and my teeter totter will look different than yours. It's understanding where my teeter totter is at. And that's why I love testing your magnesium. And there's a couple different ways to test your magnesium levels. And there's one that really shines through. And so I always recommend that after people do the 30 day soaking challenge within three to five days, they test their magnesium levels. And I like the magnesium red blood cell. That is my favorite and the most accurate form of, at this point, there's a blood serum test, there's a urine test, but they just don't the picture, the full picture of what we need, the magnesium red blood cell test. And then that way you've got accurate data from your body and you know where you're at. And then we've got to soak enough to maintain so that you're creating that magnesium rich environment where all health begins and starts. Okay. So, and then with the test, is that something you have to go external for, or you can do 
So you can go, I like to use um, walk-in labs. You can also use um, request a test. They, they run about $45, $47. And sometimes you can find a naturopath who will do it. Um, some chiropractors will do it. I have a few Western medicine doctors are starting, but that's pretty rare, few and far between. But you can go online, you purchase it, you take your receipt to a lab and you get your blood drawn and then they upload it to your online portal. And okay. we want you between 6.2 and 7.4. A couple of years ago, they dropped the standard. I'm not dropping the standard of health in my body just because as a society, we're not making the best choices and everybody else is dropping. So I still hold myself to that old standard that's always been there. And that's 6.2 to 7.4. And when you're between those numbers, you have achieved cell saturation. Okay. And that's the goal. So that's the goal. And then maintaining is the next step. So we achieve cell saturation and then we figure out our burn rate and what we need, how often we need to soak to maintain that number. Okay. And then, so it's called transdermal is how you absorb it, right? Mm -hmm. You're soaking yes. through the skin. Okay. And then, um, there was something you had mentioned on the burn rate. Um, I just had a mental hiccup, so I lost that thought. So That's okay. we'll move on. Okay. Um, so what, for those listening, like what is the suggested first best action for them to determine, um, you know, so you don't test beforehand to see what your current rate is or you know like what, if, if somebody has the financial means and that will not slow them down from purchasing magnesium and getting their soak started, go ahead, test. We found it was a, well, and let me stop there and back up. My filter is this. I want minimal input for maximum output. Because I do not want to be one of those people that spends 24 hours a day focused on their health. I am one of those people who wants to spend all my time connecting and loving on my people. <laughs> That's my goal and my why for creating health. And so I started just, I used to have people test before and after. I've never had people come back with strong magnesium levels, even if they were taking oral magnesium, because we would have to take so much oral magnesium, it would blow out our digestive system. And so I finally just said, you know what, just test after, because this is a waste of time, money, and energy, but absolutely they can start, um, find out what it is before if they want to. I just, that, that filter for me is very strong. The least amount of time, money, and energy put in. And so do that 30 day challenge and then get that magnesium red blood cell test done. And remember that magnesium shines the light on what is broken in the body. Because sometimes people will say, oh, Kristen, I soaked in the magnesium and you talked about it being relaxing. I couldn't even move my arms. I was so exhausted. Well, that's a potassium deficiency. That's magnesium shining the light that you didn't have enough potassium. And as what happened in a very oversimplified way is your adrenals went, oh, we finally have enough magnesium, drop this potassium, run over, pick up this magnesium. And so you're left barely able to move. So we need to get that 4,700 milligrams of potassium every day. I also get, oh, Kristen, I soaked in that magnesium and the muscle cramps, the muscle cramps, that's a mild potassium deficiency. I also get, oh, Kristen, I soaked in that magnesium and my heels just started to crack and peel. That's an omega-3 fatty acid imbalance. So let's get those omega-3s going in your body and let's pull out those unhealthy oils. So remember, when you start soaking in magnesium, we want you to feel calm and relaxed, not exhausted. And if there is something that's happening when you're soaking, it's magnesium shining the light on where your body needs to be focused on healing. Just like 
when we have a personal trigger, you know, and you get triggered by something, well, let's, let's investigate that trigger because that's what we need to clear in the body. And the same thing's happening with that magnesium. It's shining the light on what's not happening, what's missing in the body. And then that way we can go in and fill that in and build a strong foundation and not chase symptoms anymore. That is fascinating to uh, see that connection between uh, or, or like you're saying, it's shining the light, it's amplifying, and it's really it almost like, hey, you know, the rats are kind of running out now, and it's like, we've scared out the other junk, and it's like, let's care for it now. Right. Um, that's fascinating that your response is kind of a hat tip to some other underlying issue. You know, the other thing that happens is, is vagus nerve. I, I'm a mm. huge fan of building vagus nerve, and... Part of our exhaustion is an absolutely fried vagus nerve. Yeah. And some people will say, Kristen, you talked about the feeling of calm and feeling so relaxed. And, and then as your numbers increase, it, it starts to energize you. I didn't feel anything like that. That's just, that's garbage. I didn't feel anything. The quality and tone of your, your nerve will determine how you experience soaking. And so some people don't experience anything. That's why we want that magnesium red blood cell test for that data. This is what happened. This is where your magnesium levels are because that person that has a fried vagus nerve that there's no tone or quality. I hope you stop and put an ice pack over your chest for about 15 minutes a day, because it's a beautiful way to soothe that vagus nerve and stimulate it. I hope you end your shower with cold water because that's another beautiful way. But as that vagus nerve is toning and itself, you may not feel the pulsing that some people talk about, that most people talk about when they're soaking in magnesium. And so it also is some feedback and understanding into the tone and quality of your vagus nerve function. Wow. <laughs> you know, I've always heard, uh, and I've not dug that deep into it, but the, the critical need of understanding your vagus nerve and then ways to stimulate it. Um, was fortunate to have a gentleman on uh, last year uh, in regards to that. And he was more on the lymphatic side of things, but mm -hmm. referencing working with the, the lymph, the nerve and the blood and the mm -hmm. critical kind of three strands, as he mm -hmm. called it. Um, I, I did want to circle back on what you were talking about with your experiences or, or what we were just talking. So 30 day challenge, how soon into doing it should you start to experience some of these examples that you gave? I wish I could answer that for each person listening right now. And I wish I could tell you, we have some things that are so similar. Our cells need potassium, our cells need magnesium, but your experience for some people, it's the first day for some people it's day 35. It just is such a varied experience, depending on vagus nerve tone, on medications being taken on current stress levels and cortisol levels. There, there's just so many variables. So some people immediately and other people, it takes a while. So be patient. Yeah. Be yeah. patient. Well, and I think that's an important anecdote or, or element because it didn't happen overnight to get to wherever you are. So have some ex proper expectation that it could take some time to kind of peel back the onion. I have a lady right now on Facebook. We have an ad running for the magnesium to share with new people. And she keeps putting scam scam. If Facebook isn't going to mark this as a scam. And I'm like, why is this woman saying that it's a scam? Like this is my passion, my heart. It's what I've outside of my family. It's been my number one focus for 20 years. I do Facebook live, you know, like where is she coming from? And my husband made the comment. He said, go look up and see if she's ever ordered it. And she had. And as I interacted with her, because I, I wanted to communicate with her and she soaked one time and was frustrated. It didn't clear up her type two diabetes. Mm. That's not realistic. Yeah. And it, 
Now it's really easy to point at her and say, oh my gosh, that's ridiculous. But really all of us do that. Sure. Those unrealistic expectations. Yep. A hundred percent, hundred percent, or at least not me anyway. Uh, <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> all the time. I think I'm going to take, you know, a pill or would it do something? And it's like, well, why didn't I get the A or whatever it yeah. is? So, yeah. um, I'm just fascinated by, by, by all the things you've just discussed that, that, you know, I don't want to say just this one ingredient, but how important it is in illuminating it can be to, to really, to your point, be foundational to wellness. You know, it's so important also your source of magnesium. So I could import magnesium from Utah. I could get it from Russia, but it's loaded with heavy metals. Mm -hmm. And so it's so important when you're choosing magnesium that you're getting it from a clean source. We import ours from the Netherlands. And the other thing that's very important is that the company that you're purchasing it from is not diluting the magnesium. The FDA has written the law water does not have to be labeled if you add it because it's a sea brine, therefore it already has water. And so you don't have to add it. You want that sea brine soaking in it as it was so that you're getting the full strength. And the other thing people need to watch out for is a lab produced magnesium chloride, which is what we're soaking in is magnesium chloride. A lab produced is very inexpensive to buy on some ways. I think it's really expensive because it doesn't move your red blood cell numbers. Okay. You could soak for three years and never move your red blood cell numbers. Well, yeah, it was maybe half the price to buy, but did it do anything for you? Right. And so those are the three things we want to look at when we're purchasing magnesium is where is it coming from? Is it diluted? And was it produced in a lab? Because those three things won't move your numbers. And that's our end goal is to right. move that magnesium red blood cell number. You want the action there. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, um, Chris, and that, that's, I think, um, some great tips for folks to be cognizant of. Um, we are kind of coming up on time. I do want to res be respectful of that, but I, it's just so rich with information. Um, before I jump into kind of my hot seat for you, okay. how can folks locate you uh, and, and learn more about some of the, the offering you have to help with the magnesium? So they can go to our website, livingthegoodlifenaturally.com. I'm also very active on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. And it sounded like you had, uh, I'll call it a mastermind, but uh, a group of folks uh -huh. in support as well. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so as I said, a little hot seat, nothing too okay. strong. Okay, here it goes. Three bring questions. it on, bring it what, on. Bring it on. What are you reading right now? Oh, I am reading, um, it's called the soul of the soil and it's all about practices of regenerating the soil by Dr. Philip Callahan. He was one of my husband's mentors. He's passed away and he was a scientist and a man of great faith. And he brought both of those things together instead of walking away and saying, this can't happen with this. And it's just an incredible, insightful read. I got to meet him once and it was a life-changing experience and it's just fascinating to me. Awesome. So was it um, kind of like in regenerative farming or? Um, he, he talks about, yes, in, in a very broad way, okay. he talks about bringing the nutrient levels back to the soil, but he's a story. He, he tells stories mm -hmm. and he, um, took his grandson and his daughter and he walked through the Irish countryside for like 45 days and his insights and he's a naturalist, but he's a scientist. And so he just brings it all together. I, I don't even have words to describe how he brings it together. He's just truly a Renaissance man that when we lost him, we, we lost a light. Well, I will have to check that one out. That sounds fascinating. It's a little tricky to find, but if you ever come across it, it's, it's worth it. Awesome. Okay. What are you listening to right now? Be it music or podcast? Oh, music. So, um, my kid, my adult kids have a tradition on our youngest 
daughter's birthday that they always do a sibling trip together. And so this year it was New Orleans. And so they're all back in New Orleans. And my husband and I a little bit get FOMO. We're thrilled that as siblings, they're staying connected, yeah. but we're like, oh, we want to be with you. <laughs> and so they're back there listening to jazz and sending us little clips and, um, you know, doing some FaceTime, all of the incredible musicians there. And so we've really been focused on my husband's Southern heritage and jazz and going into the history of jazz and our dog is even named Louis Armstrong so it's <laughs> evident and we had a Ella Fitzgerald and anyway so we we love jazz music and so we've really been focused on some jazz lately because of that trip of my adult kids <laughs> nice fun. I wanted to be a sibling <laughs> yeah <laughs> fun uh all right last one what is your go-to rest and recovery method my go-to rest and recovery is two things is hydration and sleep. And I think sometimes we can buy into that. We've got to buy this or buy that and do all of these things. And then actually we need to get back to some, I call it grandma wisdom and that's sleep, <laughs> sleep, 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 and hydration. And if we don't have those two things in place, rest and recovery is not going to happen no matter what other things, even even, oh, I can't believe I'm saying this, even my beloved magnesium, <laughs> it's, it's such a part of rest and recovery. But if you don't have some of those basics, yeah. you know, magnesium is hydrophilic and it moves better. It moves more efficiently in a hydrated body. And so that rest and hydration are key components. And the first place that I go to, if I feel that overextended starting to come into my life. That is, uh, that's great to hear. Uh, yeah. Hydration. I, I was surprised I had a guest too. You talk about the statistics when it comes to like ER visits and how many of them it's like 98% uh, or something like that end up turning into hydration issues. And it, I'm just fascinated by that. And it's like, what are we doing wrong that we can't just consume some water or some mineral water, or even a little bit of an electrolyte drink? You know, my grandfather <laughs> would, would, just not understand the fact that I have a timer on my phone to alert me, to remind me, Hey, where are you at with your water? Because I do better if I'm consistent throughout the day yeah. versus how I used to do it. Oh my gosh, I haven't had water today. Guzzle it all two hours before I go to bed. <laughs> and it's just a much better fit for me to just be more consistent during the day. But that little timer reminds me, Oh, grab my water bottle get the water in. And I think, you know, you talked about earlier when you said we have to find out what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I think with water, we have to go a little bit to the excess, like, Oh, that was too much. Right. And it's right under that, that our hydration. And one of my pet peeves is when people say, Oh, drink half of your body weight in ounces and you'll be good. That's deep for me and for many people. So that that's too general. It's too mm -hmm. broad practice. See what is your hydration level? Because somebody who's built just like me might have a very different hydration level than, than I do. And so yeah. it's one of those self-discovery processes for how much water you need. I need 95 ounces every day. 95, 105, too much, 95, spot on. Spot on. Yeah, yeah and I, I can attest similarly where I've waited too late in the day and that ends up disrupting the second half, which is the sleep piece considerably. Right, right. But, well, Kristen, uh, so thankful for your time and your passion for what you do and just helping folks uh, recover and reclaim, you know, as we say here is we only have this one life to live. So we want to live it well and to its fullest extent. And uh, I want to thank you for your contribution to, to helping people do that and enable that. Oh, well, the gratitude comes right back at you. I, after I quit my radio show, I thought I'd do a podcast. <laughs> I thought, oh, I'll just transition from radio to a podcast. There is so much technology and work behind a podcast radio show. I showed up. I had an assistant. He 
flipped a button, I went live. A podcast is so much work. So I really have deep gratitude for people like you that are willing to put that time in to your podcast, to produce it, to find the guests, to coordinate with the guests, to interview the guests, to have the thoughtful questions, because it makes it really easy for non-technical people like me to show up and really share my passion. So thank you for all of that behind the scenes that I don't think a listener of a podcast understands what goes into producing a podcast and getting it on air. So thank you very much for having me on today. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the encouragement. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.